Hello everyone. Have you ever wondered what it was like to go shopping a few centuries ago? Probably not, and me neither, before I started preparing for this video. But you know that all these retail places where we go on a regular basis, like supermarkets, hypermarkets, or superstores, as they are called in America, malls, everything that is self-service, all of these are relatively recent creations. And the father of them all is the department store that appeared in the 19th century and completely reshaped, revolutionized retail. Not only on a technical level, it did it on a symbolic level too. It turned the act of shopping into a form of entertainment and accompanied the emergence of the mass consumer society. So in today's video, we're going to examine a story that could easily go unnoticed, but in fact touches all of us because it's about our everyday lives and many more things about the way our societies and economies have been changing dramatically over the past few generations about the place and status attached to the act of purchasing things and even the way our cities are built and organized. So from New York City to Paris and London we're going to take a look at why and how these temples of shopping suddenly appeared, how they worked, why they worked and what they tell us about the evolution of our lifestyle. So, before we begin, please adopt a comfortable position, relax, and let me guide you through centuries of history. To begin with, let's wonder what it was like to go shopping several centuries ago, because it had nothing to see with what most of us do today. For centuries, even thousands of years, the sale of food and small manufactured objects took place on retail markets only. Selling and buying in these places is thought to have appeared in Mesopotamia or in modern Turkey around the 7th millennium BC. And these markets typically occupied a place in the town's center. If the town was big enough, there could be small fixed workshops for skilled artisans selling things around the marketplace, like metal workers or weavers. And these markets were essentially for the urban population, which means just a small minority of people. Most people in the antiquity lived in the countryside, in hamlets or villages, and produced their own food. If they had a surplus, they could go to the nearest town and sell it at the market, or barter to buy items that they needed. Closer to our time, these markets were given a place within the Greek Agora, the central square where public life took place, and also in the Forum in Roman cities. The earliest example of what could be called a commercial center was in the Forum in Rome. There were permanent stores there, but this was exceptional because Rome was an enormous city for the antiquity. Most of retail sales, and close to all of it when it came to fresh products, took place in temporary stalls or on mats. And buying or bartering things was also not an everyday action like it became later. In fact, the vast majority of people lived almost in autarky and did not take part in the trade system most of the time. 
in this system, there was no such thing as a functioning and transparent free market in small towns. Buyers generally had only one option to buy a particular product. So the price was fixed depending on how much the buyer was willing to pay and the seller willing to work for, without much information about prices at other locations that were in any case not accessible to them. And in the Middle Age, in Europe, Another thing that prevented prices from being fixed based on supply and demand was the existence of corporations, artisans in almost all sectors, from textile and cloth making to pottery or metalware, belonged to a corporation that decided on the prices and limited competition among its members. For centuries, including as far as the antiquity, there was no unified market. In fact, international trade with better informed traders and bigger transaction volumes were closer to functioning like a supply and demand market where prices were more consistent. But this barely existed in retail because of the lack of information and transport and the existence of multiple micro-markets instead of a larger one. In medieval times, in Christian and Muslim countries, a few more permanent shops existed in towns, and this is rather well documented. Most of the time, the customers would go to a trade man's workshop and discuss purchasing options with him. In larger cities, in Italy, France, Flanders and the Low Countries, or England, there were mercers and grocers in medieval Europe who sold various items like small wares, medicines and spices. In the Middle Age, spices were precious and in high demand because they came from afar but they were used a lot in cooking and for the preservation of food. Actually, in French, the name for a small grocery store is épicerie, literally spices store, and the name has stayed since the Middle Age. All fresh and perishable products were still sold through markets, though, and another form of retail that could reach small towns or villages that had no shops was itinerant vendors who traveled the region with their products and sold where they could. The 12th and 13th centuries were a period of improved prosperity and this made more of these urban shops appear in many German English or French cities, there are street names dating from the Middle Age that recall this reality, like Mercer's Lane or Drapery Row, because for convenience and because of the corporations, the guilds system, small businesses were generally located in the same street or the same neighborhood. Until the 17th century, Long after the end of the Middle Age, the experience of shopping had very little to see with what we know today. There were no shopping window, glass was extremely rare, so nobody could see the products in a vitrine before. Shop fronts had a, a front door, sometimes with openings on the sides that were covered with shutters. Many shops served the customers directly in the street and did not even let them in. Others had space inside to receive their clients, but they were extremely dark because of the lack of windows and lighting. People had to ask the shop owners or a sales assistant what they had and the price 
prices were never transparent. You asked for them, and there was a, a margin for bargaining. The notion of customer service, or even just trying to attract customers with the display of products, was almost absent. It existed only for very high-end businesses that served the tiny, wealthy minority. And most people probably ignored that this existed. And more broadly, the notion that shopping could be a fun thing, or that you would be able to see the goods before buying them, was almost completely absent in Europe. But at the same time, in uh, Islamic countries, a form of permanent retail that did not really exist in Europe appeared, the bazaars. These were large venues with many permanent shops, where people from cities could find almost everything they needed, from food to wares to furniture or rugs. The Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, Turkey, is said to be the oldest functioning market in the world. Its construction began in 1455, shortly after the end of Byzantium. In a sense, these bazaars were closer to the form of retail we are accustomed to nowadays, with an offering that was oriented towards the client's needs rather than what suited the producers or the sellers. Now, the reason why medieval stores did not display their products was the risk of theft, obviously. I get that we may complain sometimes today about theft and insecurity in general, but it is really ill-advised to say that it was better before, at least not in this period. It was way worse, and by a margin, every single big city until recently, actually, had a significant portion of its population that lived in complete misery in the streets, with uh, no other resource than begging or stealing. This has certainly not entirely disappeared today, but it was uh, way more before. The rates of homicide were way higher than today. Theft was a constant threat for anyone living in the city, and it would have been just unthinkable to have a, a self-service store, or even one that showed too much of its products, just because they would have been stolen immediately. But this began to change in the 17th and 18th centuries. The number of stores in cities grew, and they underwent a big transformation. Prior to the 18th century, a retail store had no display cases, no counter, and uh, even less chairs or changing rooms for clients when they sold clothes. Some shop owners started to innovate in Paris or in London. This was the time when uh, a bit more sense of competition between shops and uh, the weakening of guilds pushed them to uh, differentiate their offering and try to attract more customers as opposed to just wait for them to ask. Clients began to have the opportunity to just touch products and browse them before buying. Glazing also made a huge progress and changed the outside look of stores. Products could now be seen from the street, and were an invitation to enter the store and talk to its personnel. Some stores also developed a back room for their best clients. These selected customers could be invited to this place where items were on display. Another innovation from the late 18th century when the industrial revolution was about to take off, was shopping arcades. These were multiple vendors' spaces operating under a covered roof. 
This was basically a transposition to uh, European cities of the Oriental Bazaar. Shopping arcades were a way to uh, separate potential clients from the streets that were not paved, generally, and often very uh, dirty. The first of them appeared in Paris, and they were uh, a way to uh, attract clients by providing a cleaner and uh, engaging shopping environment. These arcades kept being built in many European cities in the 19th century, including after the first department stores, and many still exist in Paris today. These arcades in big cities were created for relatively well-off clients, no longer a very small minority of aristocrats and very wealthy bourgeois. They could also interest an upper middle class of lawyers, independent business owners or doctors. Among the most spectacular and uh, bigger arcades, there were the Palais Royal in Paris, or Burlington Arcade in London, or the Victor Emmanuel Gallery in Milan. But these arcades were still for a small part of the population, for poorer classes that started to concentrate in cities and around industrial centers in the 19th century. Another type of retail venture appeared, the cooperative retail store. The new working class came from rural areas, and when they moved to the cities, they stopped producing their own food. Much bigger quantities of groceries and other products had to be brought to them. Cooperative stores were particularly developed in Britain, which had the biggest industrial working class in the first half of the 19th century. In very industry-oriented cities like Manchester, these large stores for the time stocked basic food products like flour, meat or potatoes, and they bought in large quantities to serve the blue-collar community at affordable prices with no vocation to maximize profits because they were cooperative. These stores did a lot to allow the working class to eat enough despite very low wages in the first decades of the Industrial Revolution. So by the middle of the 19th century, retail has already started to change, and these changes reflect the evolution in lifestyles. But still, retail remains very archaic when compared to what we have today. Stores have started to look more attractive, but they remain very small. They rarely let the clients near the products. They always serve them behind the counter, and uh, prices are almost never visible. You need to ask to know them. The strategy of every shop owner is to try and maximize profit by selling as expensive as possible. Promotions are almost non-existent, and there is competition between shops, but it remains difficult for customers to compare prices without seeing them, and to compare the quality of products without touching them or seeing them from close. And yet, purchasing power is rising fast, thanks to economic growth, Products can be imported from all over the world, and factories can now produce a never-seen-before quantity of consumer products, textile, clothing, shoes, furniture, decoration, accessories, clocks, tools, toys. Consumption is about to soar. Modern retail is uh, starting to take shape, and uh, society, work, and even values are changing fast. And the department store is going to 
take all this in and give birth to the first temples of consumption. Names like Harrods, Jesse Penny, Saks, Le Bon Marché, Selfridges, Bloomingdale's, Galerie Lafayette, that are still well known today, are about to enter everyone's conscience and revolutionize the way we shop and even participate in the economy. About at the same time, by the middle of the 19th century, entrepreneurs imagined in various cities a new type of store. Instead of having an arcade with various independent businesses that sometimes may offer similar products, why not, on top of selling a wide variety of products under the same roof, answer to this burgeoning demand with a much more entertaining and satisfying experience for the customers. Because the concept of a department store is not just that it is convenient to find many different things in the same place. The heart of it is to provide a shopping experience that attracts the rising upper and middle classes with a, a spectacular presentation of consumer goods, services, entertainment, novelties, and reassuring selling techniques too, like fixed prices and price tags. In a few years, department stores introduced all of these things that remain at the heart of retail today, including things like mail order, the ancestor of online sales. So of course this innovation appeared in big industrialized cities that were at the forefront of changing consumption patterns and had a big enough upper middle class to make these giant stores work and be profitable. The term department store appeared in America because these stores sold a variety of consumer goods in various thematical departments. And New York City was a precursor city for department stores. One of the first was the Marble Palace on Broadway, which opened in 1846. This store offered European merchandise and introduced new practices that made it attractive to customers, like fixed prices, and also a policy to let everyone in. It sounds surprising now, because this practice has disappeared today, except in particular cases, but before, clients were filtered at the entrance, and someone could be denied access to the store, if they did not look good enough for the store's standards. This was no longer the case at the Marble Palace to make the store more welcoming and less intimidating for smaller customers. The Marble Palace looked like a Renaissance palazzo, but it had an iron structure which permitted large windows for seasonal displays visible from the street. In 1862, the owner, Alexander Stewart, expanded and built a new store on a full block, eight floors and 19 different departments, from clothing to toys to furniture. He was one of the pioneers of a strategy that was started to be applied in London and Paris too at the same time. Instead of trying to sell at the highest possible price, he chose volume. He bought large quantities and paid the suppliers cash to lower unit price as much as possible. Then he applied a small or limited markup so that selling prices were much lower than the competition, and also transparent thanks to the first 
a fixed price policy. He had buyers who searched worldwide for providers, a management by department to adjust the prices, and he introduced services that were unfamiliar before, like waiting rooms for clients or free delivery of purchases. Other department stores with similar practices, often inspired by Stewart or directly copied, started to open in New York City. In 1858, there was Macy's and a bit later, Lord & Taylor. Department stores tended to concentrate in the same neighborhoods that became even more attractive for the customers. By the 1880s, there was a, a stretch of retail shopping in uptown Manhattan nicknamed the Ladies Mile. Similar stores also popped up at the same time or slightly later in Philadelphia, in Chicago, and progressively every American city of a significant size had one. In Britain, department stores started in bigger industrial cities like London, Manchester and Glasgow. There had been attempts to open stores with various departments under the same roof earlier, at the end of the 18th century, but they did not work very well, and department stores really took off in the second half of the 19th century in the UK. In London, like in New York City, department stores opened in the same areas especially Regent Street and Oxford Street. They also built their own facilities. They were large, luminous buildings with space for display behind glass plate windows. The beauty and ornamentation of the building was part of marketing. These stores offered an experience and it started from the outside. The most famous of them is probably Harold's today, which served a wealthier clientele. Harold's moved later and its current building is from the end of the 19th century. Another successful brand was Lewis, which quickly turned into a chain and opened in every big city in Britain. A later comer, but that had significant influence on the way department stores are operated, was Selfridges, starting in 1909. Selfridges pushed the notion of entertainment further than any other competitor in its communication and offering. Every department was structured so that customers could have easy access to every product. He added various restaurants to the store, a library, a reading room, special reception rooms where clients from Germany or France could be entertained in their own language. All of this was intended to turn the store into a place where people would spend as much time as possible and to renew their interest there was also temporary exhibits about science or innovations. As you see, selling goods remained the reason to be of these stores, but the act of shopping was being increasingly invested with a new dimension you no longer buy things out of necessity. You do it because it is pleasurable. It is a, a way to connect with the time, to socialize, to learn new things. So, in a sense, manufactured goods were given another layer of value. Their value was not just their usage, which could even become secondary. It was in all the accompanying act of buying, 
the status that it gives and the power of evocation given to merchandise. This was not entirely new, but now, instead of being limited to a tiny minority of the society with a high level of consumption and that other people did not see, it was becoming a very visible and more massive phenomenon. So criticism did not wait to appear, especially targeted at the, the possible fake and artificial symbolic value that was added by marketing and retail to mere standardized objects. This kind of criticism appeared very quickly with the development of mass market consumerism and the critics also recalled that a large part of the population in the 19th century was still excluded from this glowy consumption fest. The urban middle class was growing, but it remained a minority. For all blue-collar workers, farmers or small civil servants, this world remained totally inaccessible and the existence alone of department stores may have exacerbated social tensions. Another early critique was the supposed risk for the sanity of women and this is quite revealing of how the society worked in the 19th century. Before department stores it was almost unthinkable for a young or married woman from the upper middle class or above to go out on her own, be it for shopping or anything else. A woman alone in public space immediately raised suspicions of prostitution, a lover or any other immoral activity that could be scandalous. Department stores changed that and in a sense, but this is ambiguous, they made the status of women evolve. Most of the products sold in department stores were home equipment, clothing or accessories. This made women the natural customers at a time when their role was to maintain a home and raise children. The marketing of department stores was directly targeted at women. But going outside shopping in the street or an arcade, which was just an extension of the street, would have been uh, inappropriate. Whereas a department store offered a safe space, very open, so everyone was visible and there was no suspicious activity happening in such a place. So that department stores became a place where women could go socialize with friends and develop a life for themselves outside their home. In a sense it helped them to come out and change their status. It also turned them into economic agents that could have purchasing power and make purchasing choices for their entire family. But it was also all about consumption, decoration, homemaking, so it also comforted a very traditional role for women. And we should probably not overestimate the degree of liberty they gained thanks to department stores, but still it contributed to help women go out more and be somewhat more present in public space. A category of women that really benefited more from department stores was the sales assistants. At the largest stores, like the Marble Palace, Macy's, Harrods or the Bon Marché, there were hundreds of them. This was not a marginal phenomenon. And for a young, poor, single woman, in a city in the 19th century, life could be terribly harsh and even worse if they had children. 
they were really at the very bottom of society and many of them had no other option than prostitution to survive because there were very few job opportunities. The development of these uh, enormous stores that required a lot of feminine workforce saved many of them. They were not highly paid, but they were dressed, fed and given a status that was rather respectable and made it possible for them to build a life for themselves. Many of them could save enough money to open a business in a small town after a few years or rise in the hierarchy of the department store and acquire an education. Another leading department store of the same period was the Bon Marché in Paris and this one also was a precursor. In Paris, like in London, new forms of stores were being tried by the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th, progressively introducing some of the elements that would be gathered in department stores. The ancestors of department stores in Paris were the novelty stores, the magasins de nouveauté. These were medium-sized stores of a few hundred square feet that appeared in the years 1780 and sold a variety of items for women, most of the time manufactured in France, gloves, hats, dresses, perfumes, bags, shoes, and so on. These novelty stores sold to Parisians and people coming from other cities thanks to the growing railways network in the 19th century. Au Pont Marché was one of these stores, but it started to innovate by introducing fixed prices and something that had never been done before, a guarantee that allowed exchange and refunds for customers. The store also started to make publicity and display the goods in a way that allowed the customers to see and touch them before buying. The turnover was multiplied by 10 in a few years and the store moved to a new location where it expanded several times until 1872. In the process, the floor space rose from 300 square meters to 50,000 square meters, which made it the largest store in the world by then. To give you an idea, a large supermarket or a hypermarket today has an area of 5,000 to 15,000 square meters. So that was about five times more. And like Stewart in New York City or Harrods in London, the owner, Aristide Boussico, did not save on the building itself. It received a very modern iron architecture that left large atriums inside, overhung by glass domes, powerful lighting and uh, ultimately 2,000 employees to make the store work. Boussico created new services that were marketed through paid advertising in newspapers, such as a reading room for husbands while their wives were shopping, entertainment for children, and he also started to print and send out catalogues. The store also served as a flagship for mail-order sales in all of France. This new way of selling was quickly copied in other countries. Early department stores also invented modern mail order because they had the infrastructure and the brand name to do it. Now mail order is probably a dying form of retail since the emergence of online sales, but it is actually the ancestor of uh, online retail. Customers received catalogs every three or six months 
with pictures or photos of the products and they could place their order by mail, send a check and receive their order a few weeks later. Online distribution is just a more flexible, faster and easier way to do the same thing, sell at a distance and ship by mail. One novel that captures the how of the public and the transformations of retail and the society that took place in the second half of the 19th century is Au Bonheur des Dames, The Ladies' Delight by Emile Zola. There is a story in it with characters, but the topic really is the emergence of this new form of retail its consequences on work and management, and also the decline of all the forms of retail. Because another aspect of this reality, in every single city where department stores appeared, is that they wiped out the competition, and many smaller stores that did not have the purchasing power to lower prices, the appeal, or just the capacity to adapt disappeared. In a few decades, they were turned into dinosaurs and many of them had to replicate the practices of department stores, improve their display of products, provide service, a wider range of options to choose from, and put price tags everywhere. The peak for department stores was really the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. Because after revolutionizing retail, it then became their turn to be attacked by new formats more suited to consumption patterns. Department stores are still around today, but they have become a smaller and smaller format in terms of market share since the 1950s due to the emergence of new concepts of stores. And it all started with supermarkets and then hypermarkets, the super centers or super stores that actually transposed the department store model to a more food oriented offering. And they added two things, easy access by car and self-service. Department stores were ideally located in city centers before car ownership became massive in the 1950s. But with more individual mobility and people moving further and further away from the city, suburban malls and supermarkets with lower real estate costs became much more competitive and easier to access to. The other big change after World War II is the generalization of self-service in retail. Self-service was unthinkable before due to the risk of theft and uh, this remains a concern for every self-service store today. But it also allows massive productivity gains because large stores no longer need an army of sales assistants. All in all, it contributed to cut costs dramatically and became the natural system for all stores where customers can pick up and carry the goods. Department stores adapted to this and introduced a degree of self-service over the past few decades, but they always remained rather labor-intensive. It depends on the countries, and sometimes they still have a literal army of sales. If you ever enter the Japanese department store, for example, you will see that at almost any time of the day, there are more personnel than clients. On top of supermarkets, department stores were attacked in the past 60 years by category killers selling only one line of products and offering much more variety and lower prices than department stores. It can be clothes, furniture, toys, 
And finally, over the past 15 years, online retail has taken off and is now threatening every form of physical retail. There is little department stores can do to counter all this competition. Actually, it reveals that very much like when they appeared and eliminated many of their competitors, their format is no longer well adapted to the mainstream, at least. This is why the number of department stores tends to stagnate or even decrease in many countries. And when their location and buildings are low, they often try to adopt a high-end positioning, selling more exclusive products to a wealthier urban client base and tourists. This is what uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, uh, Harrods, or the Bon Marché and the Galerie Lafayette do in Paris. It is likely that these uh, department stores are here to stay, but they increasingly turn into monuments and tourist destinations. They are no longer the embodiment of modernity in retail that they once were. Smaller department stores are still present in mid-sized cities and malls, where they often serve as anchor stores that attract customers to the place. So in this sense, they are still useful and significant for urbanism and commercial real estate. But they are under threat and a revival seems hard to imagine at this stage. However, all forms of retail that once were much more important can survive for a very long time. There are still markets, there are still many small specialty shops, even, uh, even though these formats are no longer at the forefront of the retail industry. This is all for today, and uh, as always, I Hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you learned a couple of things. I'll be back soon for another story on a different topic. And in the meantime, sleep well. Au revoir.